It is so good to have you join us for our Sunday morning Community Bible Church service. And I'm glad you're here with us. Let's pray. Let's believe God for his anointing on this service. Dear Lord, Lord, thank you that we can come to you and know that you hear us, O oh God. I pray that you would guide and that you would lead us in our church service today. Oh God, minister to every heart. Lord, give us your touch and your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing a couple of songs. Of love the old songs. Here's an old one. I love my Savior too. Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to Him I sing, onward I go. Closely to Him I cling, the sing still flow. I love my Savior too. Oh, I love my Savior, He loves me too. His favor in everything I do. Walking with Him each day, the light that shines. Doing His will always, never repine. Kneeling to Him, I pray, I will not find. I love my Savior too. My Savior, He loves me too. I see His favor in everything I do. Happy to serve my friend, lean on His arm. Rapture will never end, nothing alarm. Voices. Under his charm, I love my Savior too. Oh, I love my Savior, he loves me too. And I see his favor in everything I do. Oh, I love the Lord. Appreciate what God has done for me. Praise the Lord. Here's another old song, Never Alone, Never Alone. I've seen the lightning flashing and heard the thunder go. Wrong. 
never to leave me, never to leave me alone. The world's bitter spins are blowing, temptations sharp and keen. I feel a peace in the Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord for a moment. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord, that you promise never to leave us or forsake us. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a good God we serve. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. I want to preach to you this morning about a, a very somber subject, uh, God's wrath. Uh, the title of my message is A Brief Perusal of God's Wrath. And my text is John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Let's pray. My Lord, I pray, Lord, this morning that you would be with us and that you would minister to every heart. Lord, help us, oh God, to know and understand that you are entirely just in your wrath, Lord, that it's us, Lord, that needs to come to you, Lord, touch every heart this morning in Jesus' name, amen. A brief perusal of God's wrath. Now, the wrath of God is a difficult concept to understand, it, especially when we make an attempt to reconcile the wrath of God with the love of God. And many stumble at the thought of God being wrathful. But as incongruous as it may seem, love and wrath go together in God. Love and wrath go together in God. Now, on the surface, that may seem to be an impossibility, but let me give you an example. Just a few days ago, my five-year-old grandson, Jude... <laughs> Love my grandkids. Oh, they're so precious. And Jude went with me to pick up pizzas for lunch. And on the way back, we got the pizzas. On the way back, we pulled into our driveway. And as we pulled in, I remarked that Olivia had just arrived and was walking in the door. And Jude was so excited to see his Aunt Olivia that he opened the door and started to jump out of the car while I was pulling into the parking space. Oh, oh my heart leaped out of my chest and, and not hardly even knowing what I was doing. I was so afraid I screamed at Jude, close that door and don't ever open the car door when this car is moving. And then I continued. I, I was so mad at him because the what could have happened? I, I, I continued to chew on him and, and verbally give him what for. I was so angry with him for the near disaster and the potential of mortally wounding a child I loved more than my own life itself. <sighs> Jude was, was quiet while I berated him, and then he got out of the car. After we stopped, I mean, he shut the door, and after we stopped, he got out of the car and went ahead of me, and he waited for me up on the deck, and Whenever I got up on the deck, he said softly, he said, I'm sorry I opened the door, Papa. I won't do it again. Oh, it melted me. And then I, I felt horrible 
about, about getting so angry with him. I hugged him tightly and assured him of how deeply and completely I loved him. And we made up together and all was good after that. Anger and love. I'll be honest with you. All I could see in that split, split second of him. I mean, the car was moving. And if he would have jumped out, he would have had been pulled under those wheels. And oh, still makes me shudder to think about that. Anger and love. In Psalm 106, verses 35 to 46, the psalmist speaks of how Israel behaved like the citizenry around them. All of those people that didn't know God, Israel began acting like them. They, they served their idols, even to the point of sacrificing their own children to demons. You can read about it, Psalm 106, verses 35 to 46. They murdered their own children in cold blood by offering them up to Canaanite idols. They desecrated the land by shedding innocent blood. And all of this made God really angry. Did that mean that he didn't love his people anymore? No, not at all. God was angry because he loved them so much. And he couldn't stand to see his loved ones killing their own babies. God doesn't stay angry. He doesn't stay wrathful unless he has to. Isaiah 54, verses 7 and 8. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. God loves us. Even when he is angry, he loves us dearly. The nations of the world. Does God get angry with the nations? of the world for rejecting him. Well, it seems that he probably does, not just Israel, but all of the nations. And God has every right to his wrath. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel interpreted a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar, and in that dream... All of the world's empires were pictured all through the ages. Were pictured, all of those empires were pictured as a single unit, a single statue. The first and greatest was Babylon. The golden head of the statue. The prideful, selfish spirit of Babylon that rejected the authority of the God of heaven back then seems to continue in the nations of the world all the way until the very end of time. These nations will suffer the wrath of God because of their own actions. Let's look, let's look at a couple of passages from the Revelation. Revelation 14, verses 8 through 11. 
And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The same there in verse 10 shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Yes, Babylon was back in Daniel's time, but these prophecies are all the way even to a time beyond us. God doesn't want anyone, no one, to go to the lake of eternal fire and torment. And it makes him angry when peoples and nations turn aside his kindness and goodness to pursue their own ungodly agendas. Revelation 16 Verses 17 through 21. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon earth the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great and the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. Babylon. Babylon here in chapter 16 probably is not referring to the ancient city in Iraq. It's referring to any nation that rejects God, included in that mindset, that spirit of, of, of turning aside from God. They're all included in these judgments, God becomes angry when his good and righteous precepts are ignored by the created. Why? Why would that be? God's love for his creation is intense. And he can't bear the damage they do to themselves when they ignore his goodness. The wrath of God is a deep and frightful subject. Again, just a brief, a, a brief overview here. I have seven New Testament passages that give us a, a brief look at the Bible's view 
of the wrath of God. Number one, wrath is real. Wrath is real. Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Various people view the wrath of God as different things. Some think that it's something that doesn't concern them. Some think that it's something that's not real, a, a fairy tale, as it were. Some think that the wrath of God is just a big joke or something perhaps that they will just worry about later, not right now. But I want to assure you the wrath of God is real. And the sooner we take account of where we stand in relationship with God, the better. Number two, wrath is justly deserved. God's not unfair in issuing his wrath. Romans chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness, and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, God will give, I'm adding that in, God will give eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, God will give indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. God's including all humanity, all of his creation in this. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Sadly, a person can take God's goodness and patience for granted. Sometimes people think that, that they perhaps got away with the sin because God hasn't pounced on them yet. Nothing happened. There's a God in heaven that knows. And we have to give an account to him. Everyone will get the fate they have decided for themselves. Number three, God is the judge. Romans 3, 5, and 6. But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? That word vengeance is the verb form of wrath, to take vengeance, wrath. Paul said, well, I, I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? God is the creator. And he has the right to be the judge of the world. I know people don't want to be judged. 
People want to be able to do the judging on somebody else. We want to be able to pick who's right and who's wrong. But we don't get to do that judging. Only God is the judge. Romans chapter 14 and verse 12. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Number four, the law works wrath. Romans chapter four, verse 15. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. If there wasn't a law, there wouldn't be any transgression of that law. If there wasn't a rule, who could break the rule that's not there? But there is a law, and the law does not justify us. It only shows us just how wicked we are. And because of that, all the law brings is wrath. Just because one goes to church does what the church teaches and tries to live by God's law, that does not mean a person will automatically escape the wrath of God. Trying to be good enough to impress God only makes matters worse. God is not impressed with your righteousness. Never has been, never will be. The law works wrath. Number five, the blood of Christ saves us from wrath. Oh, now we're getting into the meat of everything I wanted to share with you. Romans 5, 8, and 9. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Hallelujah! Glory to God! Here is the love of God. Jesus died for us even though we don't deserve it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Justification by the blood of Jesus is a free gift from God to us. We can't even begin to afford the great price that God paid for our salvation. Because of the shed blood of Jesus... On Calvary's cross, we are saved from the wrath of God. We deserved that wrath because of our sins, but the blood of Jesus saves us from God's wrath. Hallelujah! Number six, we have been delivered from God's wrath. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have been delivered from the wrath of God that should have been ours. That deliverance came through one man, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, the future. Before Jesus, the future was pretty bleak, pretty dim. But now the future is bright and hopeful because Jesus died for us. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, would you consider accepting his gracious act in which he removed the sword of judgment hanging 
over your head. Hallelujah. Jesus has done the work. Number seven and lastly, Jesus took God's wrath in our place. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Hallelujah. God doesn't want you to be under his wrath. He wants you to be saved. How is it possible that one might escape the wrath of God? Who gets the punishment that you deserve? Jesus does. Hallelujah. Jesus gets the punishment that you deserve, that I deserve. Jesus took the wrath of God in your place. Jesus went through what should have been yours. You do not have to suffer the wrath of God because Jesus suffered it for you. Because of Jesus, you have eternal life instead of eternal punishment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a Savior. What a Savior we have. In conclusion, back to the text we began with. Here are the two sides to the issue. Let me read the text we started out with John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So you have two choices. You can believe on the Son and have everlasting life, or you can suffer the eternal wrath of God in an eternity of torment. And honestly, the choice is entirely yours. When my grandson Jude apologized, Papa, I won't open the car door again. Oh, oh. He asked my forgiveness for opening that car door and putting his own life in danger. Not that he knew that he was doing it, but, but he was. When he asked for my forgiveness, I want to tell you as soon as I could set those pizzas down on the table, I grabbed him, I hugged him. My forgiveness was immediate. My anger was completely gone. And I owed him an apology. I hadn't done him right either. Not that God treats us that way, but the point I want you to see and to know is that when we ask for forgiveness, the Father is so gratified to give the forgiveness that he's been offering all along. Oh, if you will accept, would you do that? All you have to do is accept the free gift of forgiveness of sins that God is already offering you. Will you do that? Let's pray. Oh, my Lord. Oh, God, what a wonderful, wonderful Savior you are, my Lord. You've been so good. Thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity of forgiveness 
of our sins. You are just. Lord, you are righteous. But dear Jesus, you became sin for me so that I could have your righteousness. Lord, if there's one, Lord, that will, that will come to you. Lord, please show them by your spirit that all they have to do is just talk to you like I'm talking to you and say, oh God, I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry for what I've done against you, and I want your forgiveness. Lord, if they'll do that, I know it's immediate, complete, and total. Touch each one. Go with each one. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.